Okay, so let us continue our discussion of coherent state path integrals. So, if you remember uh, what is coherent state path integrals, uh, basically it is about uh, wanting to study quantum mechanical systems using Lagrangians, but uh, rather than uh, think of uh, the Lagrangian as uh, involving uh, you know the usual generalized coordinates like the position and uh, uh, the velocity that is q and q dot, that is how you normally think of your classical Lagrangian. Basically, quantum mechanics can be re-derived or basic, it can be extracted from a classical Lagrangian by uh, saying that uh, you see not all paths are. Uh, so, in other words, usually what happens is that if somebody tells you the classical Lagrangian that is L of q comma q dot, then you know that if uh, there is one path which obeys the Euler Lagrange equations. So, that is precisely the classical path, but a quantum particle is not going to always select the classical path. So, what you do to uh, study quantum mechanics is using Lagrangians is you say that uh, you see all paths are allowed, but each path comes with some weight and that weight is basically proportional to e raised to i by h bar times the action. The action is it's basically the time integral of the Lagrangian, Lagrangian integrated over time from some initial to final time. So, basically the weight itself is a complex number of unit modulus. So, so that is the funny thing about uh, the path integral approach to quantum mechanics. Basically, it does not tell us that in fact, superficially it seems like all paths are equally probable because you see. Uh, so, basically what uh, path integral approach says is that if you want to find the average of any expectation value of anything, uh, what you have to do is uh, basically um, rewrite this in terms of the action and uh, divide by the. Um, so, you integrate over all paths and then you divide by the appropriate normalization. So, this presumably depends on the path. So, this will depend on x x dot whatever it is, it can depend on x x dot, but bottom line is you are integrating over all paths all x's. So, so if you have some x 1 t 1 x i t i is your initial and x f t f as your final then uh, there will be a whole bunch of possible paths. So, what this says is that all of them are allowed in quantum mechanics, see unlike in classical mechanics only one path is allowed, all other paths are strictly forbidden, only one path is allowed, but in quantum mechanics all paths are allowed, but each comes with a weight and the funny thing about this weight is it is a complex number of unit modulus. So, that means that if you just look at the absolute value of this weight, it is 1. So, implying therefore, that uh, it seems like the probability of uh, the particle choosing any path is pretty much uh, the same, which seems rather counterintuitive and paradoxical, because we expect uh, classical paths to be slightly more favored even in a quantum system. But the reason why uh, that is, uh, you know, I mean, the reason why this approach is not wrong is because you see that your intuition that the classical path has to be slightly favored is recovered by a realization that it, the Planck's constant is the one that is very small. So, when it is very small, the uh, this, this is a phase term, it is going to oscillate rapidly and the most of the paths kind of uh, they cancel themselves out, because as you move along the path the phase oscillates rapidly because of the smallness of the Planck's constant. So, the only paths that are likely to contribute substantially are those which minimize the action. So, you see because h is already minimized and it is in the denominator and you had better minimize the numerator also, otherwise the ratio is going to be infinite and if it is infinite e raised to i times infinity kind of rapidly 
fluctuates between plus and minus 1 and uh, averages out to 0. So, if you want to prevent that from happening, you should uh, ensure that uh, the Planck's constant which is very small will also imply that the action is as minimum as possible. Uh, so, to try to keep pace with the catch up with the smallness of Planck's constant. So, bottom line is that uh, that is how you recover classical physics from this path integral approach to quantum mechanics. So, now this uh, coherent state path integral is not about studying uh, this path integral using this approach, where this approach is about uh, integrating over paths and your action depends on the position and generalized uh, position and the generalized velocity. But I want to study, uh, I want to write down a Lagrangian uh, not in terms of uh, the usual generalized position, generalized velocities, but I want to write it in terms of the classical analog of creation and annihilation operators, because see generalized position and generalized velocities are classical versions, I mean they are classical variables. But however, you see in quantum mechanics uh, when you rewrite uh, your Hamiltonian in terms of creation and annihilation operators, you get A and A dagger which, and these are complex. So, if you want to now study the same system which is now expressed in terms of these creation and annihilation operators which are complex operators, then you are forced to uh, invoke the notion of a complex eigenvalue of these operators, which you can then use to construct a Lagrangian in terms of uh, the eigenvalues of A and A dagger. So, which is precisely what we have done here, this is what that is. This is basically the e raised to i by h bar, uh, again I keep forgetting the h bar that is there. So, it is e raised to i by h bar integral of the action and this is my action for the harmonic oscillator in terms of the coherent state, in terms of the eigenvalues of the creation and annihilation operators. So, now as usual you see uh, this is if I wanted to calculate the expectation value of some uh, I mean some Green's function, but let us only focus on this ok, because I have to integrate over end points and all that. So, I have done, but let us focus only on this. So, now uh, if I want to evaluate a path integral, how did we do it in the case of uh, harmonic oscillator when we were studying it in the x, and, uh, x dot language. That means, in terms of the original uh, position and generalized velocity language. So, the way we did that is we uh, looked at the classical solution of the uh, the extremum the uh, path which extremizes the action, so that uh, we can then go ahead and expand our path around that extremum. And uh, so, in order to find the extremum, we look at the variation of the action and set it equal to zero. And uh, following very standard methods, we get these uh, equations. So this is the classical path that comes out. Now, you see uh, we have to also ensure that uh, the, uh, uh, so if the starting uh, starting path is, I mean the, the z value when it starts off at t equal to t i z 0, then z when it uh, at the end point t equal to t f, uh, we postulate that the z value is z n. So, that therefore, the z n and z 0 are related in this way, they are related to t f and t i. Uh, again, uh, I keep uh, listen. Uh, I mean, I put h bar equals one. Otherwise, it's h bar omega into. Oh, sorry, you know, now it's still omega. Omega is frequency. T is time. That's fine. Okay, here it's fine. But there, I should have introduced it. Now, but nevertheless, uh, bottom line is. So now, what you do is you uh, re rewrite your path as the classical path plus deviation from the classical path. So, this is this z tilde is basically deviation from the classical path and because all paths uh, start and end at the same point, the deviations should become 0 at the starting and ending points. Okay. So, now if you substitute that you will see that all cross terms drop out and you will get a, a classical answer multiplied by this quantum fluctuation. Okay. 
So the point is that you see the advantage of you might think why why do we always split it up this way? Why do we split up the path in terms of a classical path plus a quantum fluctuation? See the reason why we do that is because the quantum fluctuation now obeys periodicity because the original path there is, there is no periodicity at t equal to ti it is z0 at t equal to tf it is some unrelated zn. So, there is no connection between z0 and zn, but however by construction z tilde is 0 at t equals ti it is also 0 at t equal to tf. So, that implies that uh, this uh, periodic function of its argument uh, where the period is basically tf minus ti. So, that is what I have done here. So, I have constructed a Taylor series uh, where uh, the function vanishes at both ti and tf and it is periodic with respect to time with period tf minus ti. So, this is the most general way of doing that. So, now you can go ahead and uh, evaluate uh, this particular integral. Okay. So, if you evaluate this particular integral, look I have used conventional methods now to evaluate uh, this path integral. So, I have just pointed out that you could do it this way. Yeah, so uh, rather I have evaluated the rest of it. I have evaluated this, this, this. So, you see when I do that I end up with this. So, it, this is still there. This is the uh, integration over quantum fluctuations. The rest of it has been evaluated. Yeah, because finally we are going to be able to compare. So, this is the coherent state uh, path integral is the coherent state path integral version of the Green's function. So, it is basically is the coherent state path integral version of the Green's function, but there is also the Hamiltonian uh, approach to this calculating uh, the Green's function if you recall. So, this is a traditional Heisenberg picture, well in this case it is uh, yeah it is the, the Heisenberg picture, well you can think of it as true, it is actually Schrodinger picture because see the states, this is a state which evolves with time. So, it has evolved from T i to T f. So, you can go ahead and evaluate that. Okay. So, if you evaluate that you will end up with uh, this result. I mean it is a little bit uh, of a tedious algebra. Okay. So, you will end up with this result. Okay. So, now uh, this is the this is the result that uh, you have obtained and this is uh, equal to whatever we got way back. So, basically what this approach tells you is it tells you how to evaluate. Uh, so, remember that this was some constant. So, this was some some constant which was it was one of those g t f minus t i types. Yeah, so, that is what it was. So, bottom line is that uh, yeah, it was something like that. So, that is what it was g t f minus t i and the rest of it gets evaluated. Uh, yeah, so, it is a lot of tedious algebra and you have to go through it. So, most of the interesting uh, dependencies are already contained here. This is that uh, g of t, t f minus t i. Okay, so, bottom line is that with some effort you can convince yourself that the coherent state path integral approach for the harmonic oscillator gives you the same Green's function as you would get if you did the conventional path integral for the quantum harmonic oscillator using position coordinates and generalized velocities and so on. So, yeah, so that is uh, uh, important and it is uh, important for you to understand that because uh, you will see that uh, in the end I am going to be able to generalize these two fields because after all uh, these the systems that we are studying are quantum fields. So, till now I have only introduced uh, point particles. So, that is one mass tied to one spring and I am studying that quantum mechanically using a uh, whole bunch of approaches you know whether it is starting from the original Schrodinger's approach of wave functions, uh, Hermit polynomials then uh, writing in terms of creation annihilation and studying in terms of uh, those ladder operators and so on and so forth. 
or studying the quantum harmonic oscillator green function using the conventional path integral which is uh, which involves position generalized position generalized velocity in this case x x t and x dot t so and lastly uh, i studied the classical counterpart of a dagger a plus half into h bar omega so that is basically the coherent state path integral approach so you construct the adjoint of the hamiltonian with lagrangian and the lagrangian will be basically uh, classical because it will be classical because uh, z and z dash are complex numbers which are commuting with each other and you integrate over all possible such complex number paths and then you get the same greens function as uh, you would if you had done uh, conventional things so now the question is uh, how do you uh, uh, so this was all the harmonic oscillator a dagger a plus half so that means uh, the commutator of a and a dagger is one but then uh, the commutator is one means basically you are studying bosons but uh, in nature you know that there are other types of particles called fermions so you should be able to study fermions also because after all you know electrons are fermions all these quarks leptons these are all fermions and the bosons are all the force carriers like photons gluons w and z bosons and uh, whatever so those are all uh, bosons so typically bosons are force carriers and uh, material particles of fermions and since both exist in nature we should be able to study both quantum mechanically and both are thought of as excitations of some field so just like quarks and leptons are excitations of a suitable matter field uh, a quark field or a lepton field so similarly uh, photons are excitations of the electromagnetic field and the wz bosons are excitations of the electroweak field uh, basically you know weinberg salam and glasho unified uh, the weak force with the electromagnetic force so that's called the electroweak theory so so the fields there correspond to basically excitation of the electroweak field so that could be either photons or the w boson or z bosons so then uh, you have uh, strong forces uh, that which is responsible for holding the nucleus together so the strong nuclear force uh, the material particles are quarks but the force carriers are gluons so basically you need a theory which describes not only gluons like a dagger a would correspond to uh, because gluons are bosonic particles so they will correspond to a dagger a type of thing but fermions will be uh, also important because you see the material particles of fermions so we should be able to do uh, we know how to do the conventional type of uh, quantum mechanics using creation and annihilation operator for fermions that's quite easy because after all in a, if you have a finite uh, system then if you if you have a say, suppose you have a state you want to create a fermion you can't create one more unless that fermion comes uh, attached with some label like spin up or spin down so if it doesn't come attached with any label then you can create either one fermion in that level or no fermions yeah so the question is the following so how do you study fermions using path integrals that's an important question because you see in order to study anything using path integrals you should first construct a classical lagrangian so even though you are studying quantum mechanics you have to first construct a classical lagrangian and then you construct the classical action but uh, then the, you don't uh, then you that's where you stop then you don't go ahead and you know, write down the euler lagrange equation rather what you do is you insert the classical action in the exponent of some weight so that means you construct a weight of the form e raised to i by h bar times the action and that weight is what tells you uh, how much weight a certain quantum mechanical path uh, basically as, uh, how much weight a path has when a quantum particle traverses along that path 
so that weight is basically proportional to e raised to i by h bar s so therefore in order to do path integral approach to quantum mechanics it appears that you really need a classical lagrangian but the funny question now is how can you construct the classical theory of a fermion because that's what it seems to imply because you see th there is a classical theory of a mass tied to a spring this is basically the classical harmonic oscillator because the quantum particles or the excitations of mass tied to a spring uh, uh, manifest themselves as bosons because a and a dagger uh, they have the commutative property that is commutator of a and a dagger is one however uh, there are particles in nature that do not manifest themselves as boson they manifest themselves as fermions so now the question is are there objects in nature that correspond to classical analogs of fermions because you know that there is a mass and there is a spring and you uh, you know tie them together that's what a classical analog of a boson would look like meaning in some sense uh, the boson comes out by quantizing a mass tied to a spring so the question you can naturally ask is what classical system when quantized gives you fermions is it mass tied to a spring no it will give you bosons then what tied to what will when quantized give you a fermion so the answer to that is uh, basically no, nothing that there is no classical analog at least that's the conventional answer so there is no classical analog of a fermion so that means th there is nothing which when quantized gives you a fermion the fermion is already quantum basically there is so usually you are given the impression that quantum mechanics is uh, kind of uh, not possible unless you have a classical description to begin with is that's how you are taught quantum mechanics and uh, of course with good reason because most of the systems do have classical analogs so it makes perfect sense like the electromagnetic field it has a classical analog and with the classical maxwell equations and then when you quantize it you get photons so the question is uh, now which classical set of equations which when quantized will give you something like an electron which is a quantum particle so the answer is unfortunately nothing there is no classical system which when quantized will give you a, an electron an electron is already quantum and there is nothing classical uh, about it that there is no classical version of an electron there is a classical version of a boson which is mass tied to a spring there is no classical version of a fermion so so we have to learn how to so but then so now we are stuck because we need a classical lagrangian to do path integrals but then there is no classical system as such so we have to uh, you know cook up something so that cooking up something will involve using some very strange mathematics so that strange mathematics tells us that the eigen values of the creation operator of uh, say if suppose c is your uh, annihilation of a fermion so suppose you have a, so, so if you have a state uh, you can either have one fermion or no fermion because it doesn't come with any other label so if i take that state which does not contain any fermion and i try to annihilate it i am going to get zero now i can construct a state with one fermion by acting the creation operator on that state with no fermion then if i try to uh, annihilate that i get uh, a state with no fermions but uh, more importantly if i try to create one more uh, fermion in a state that already has a fermion i get zero immediately because of pauli principle so you see uh, now what we want is uh, this pauli principle is this anti commutation rule so the point is what we want to do is uh, we want to create uh, so in other words we want to construct the uh, eigen states of the fermionic annihilation operator 
So, because the eigen, eigen states and eigen values of the bosonic annihilation operators are simply complex numbers, any complex number can be. So, so basically you sell a, pick a complex number, you can construct a state labeled by that complex number which will automatically be by suitable construction an eigen state of the uh, bosonic annihilation operator. But now if you ask the question, can I do that for a, a fermionic annihilation operator? Well, formally you can always write this because uh, you can say let eta be that eigenvalue which corresponds to the eigenvalue of the fermionic annihilation operator and this is what it is. But now you see keep in mind that c squared is 0. That is if you try to annihilate twice you will get 0. So, now suppose you act this, this uh, supposed uh, uh, eigenstate equation, eigenvalue equation by another annihilation. What will you get? This will become c squared which is 0, but then this will give me uh, c times eta which will give me eta squared because e c times eta is another eta times the state eta. So, the eigenvalue times the state. So, there is already the eigenvalue there. So, if uh, I multiply the two eigenvalues, I will get eta squared, but this is 0, c c is 0. So, eta squared should also be 0 because the state itself is not 0. So, what that means is these eigenvalues are non-zero because obviously they are non-zero. They are supposed to label some non-trivial eigenvalue but their uh, square is 0. So, uh, so obviously, they cannot be ordinary complex number numbers because there is no ordinary complex number whose which is not 0, but whose square is 0. But uh, in mathematics, there are objects that have these properties and they are called Grassmann numbers. They are called Grassmann as the name of some mathematician. So, it is Grassmann variable or Grassmann numbers. So, Grassmann numbers are numbers uh, which have this property that if uh, eta 1 is a Grassmann number and eta 2 is another Grassmann number, eta 1 into eta 2 is minus eta 2 into eta 1 and eta 1 squared equals eta 2 squared equals 0. Okay. So, these are the properties of Grassmann numbers and moreover you can show that any function of some Grassmann number at most will involve uh, just uh, you know, just so if you do a Taylor series, see if you do a formal Taylor series, what is this? It's f zero plus eta f dash zero plus eta squared uh, f, but eta squared is zero because eta is Grassmann number, but eta cubed is also zero because eta square eta cubed is eta squared into eta, but eta squared is zero, so eta cubed is also zero. So, everything is 0 except eta to the power 0 which is 1 and eta to the power 1 which is eta and all higher powers are 0. If all higher powers are 0, any function of the Grassmann variable is linear. So, that makes uh, some enormous simplification there. So, uh, so, basically what will happen is that you can now go ahead and construct uh, coherent states uh, with these types of properties. So, now you can show that uh, basically the Grassmann variables have these funny properties like this because uh, usually you think that uh, uh, you know if you use your usual approach like x and p type of thing you know that you uh, see what is uh, this is. So, if you act p uh, x p like this. So, on the one hand it is eigenvalue p into x p, uh, but on the other hand this is basically minus i h bar d by d x. So, that therefore, you will get an equation. So, if you solve you will get i uh, e p x p by h bar as your overlap. So, x overlap p is e raised to i p x by h bar. So, similarly here also you will get uh, the overlap between this and this is something like that. But then uh, you see because these are Grassmann numbers, if you Taylor series only if, uh, zeroth order and first order ter terms survive, all higher order terms are zero because eta squared is zero and eta dash squared is zero, etc., etc. So similarly, the Dirac delta function has this funny property that 
because uh, we expect Dirac delta to be x delta x is 0. So, because you see the Dirac delta this this whole thing is 0 if x is not 0, but if x is 0 uh, it is still 0 because the coefficient is 0. So, the entire uh, generalized function is 0. So, if you think of this x as now a Grassmann number. So, now you can uh, see that because any function can only be written like this. So, it is therefore uh, mandatory that the Dirac delta function is the Grassmann itself. So, and if you integrate over uh, Dirac delta you will get 1. So, the integral of uh, the Grassmann is 1. So, it is basically something like a definite integral. So, like that you can uh, construct many many uh, such and the integration is same as the, that is the most bizarre thing about Grassmann. So, uh, so the thing is uh, that if you integrate uh, if you integrate the Grassmann variable, so this is some kind of a definite integral. So, it is the same as differentiating the because once you differentiate this whole thing becomes a constant because f theta is anyway linear in theta. So, if you differentiate it becomes a constant. So, a definite integral of a function over the Grassmann variable is same as its derivative which is something very hard to believe, but it is true. So, now you can just go ahead and uh, uh, so the just like case of uh, bosonic um, coherent state you have this over completeness here also you will have similar over completeness, but keep in mind that this is very simple. This is same as 1 minus theta dash theta. So, it is not really I mean it is overkill to write it like that. So, same same procedure we follow exactly the same procedure and when you do you will end up some with something very similar, but except that now you have to evaluate the path integral and even that is also very similar ok. So, but when you evaluate it you will get something much simpler than what you will get in the case of uh, bosons because there. Uh, you can have as many bosons as you want in a state, but fermions you can have either 0 or 1 and you will get a Green's function that is incredibly simple like this. So, I will allow you to look through these steps because I would not spend I probably would not even ask you these questions in the assignment because it is important if uh, you want to specialize in particle physics. Uh, I think condensed matter people do not use uh, Grassmann variables that much but particle physics people use it quite a bit at least the field theory crowd of particle physics. So, it is kind of uh, worthwhile knowing it to some extent. So, now you can generalize this to field. So, you see if you have an electron field you can say how what it looks like. So, the coherent state path integral of electrons in a solid because now, electrons being fermions you have the fermionic coherent state path integral of a Fermi gas you know in a solid I mean. So, you, you can imagine that that could potentially be useful. So, uh, I am going to stop here as far as uh, path integrals are concerned especially coherent state path integrals. I may not have done full justice to the subject especially the fermionic coherent state path integral, but it is there in the book. So, if you look it up. So, I am going to spend the next uh, two lectures which will conclude this course discussing my own research. So, I have uh, developed certain non local operators uh, in uh, quantum many body theory which I believe are extremely important, but they are very underdeveloped in the sense that uh, they show a lot of promise, but they are extremely technical and uh, very hard to manipulate. But I believe that if uh, you put in the effort and learn how to utilize them properly, they will shed very deep light on various aspects of quantum many body theory. So, I want to discuss those objects and th they go by the name of non local operators in quantum many body theory. So, that is the last topic of this uh, NPTEL MOOCs course and I will probably spend maybe a maximum of 2 or maybe 3 lectures very likely two lectures uh, explaining that. So, after that I am uh, considering this course as more or less done. So, I continue to encourage you to ask questions over email over live sessions 
try to ask specific technical questions after reading the text and listening to the YouTube videos. Ask me specific technical questions. Don't ask me vague questions like I did not understand this subject. So ask me a specific question from the chapter and I'll answer it. Okay, thanks for uh, going along for the ride with me. So I hope uh, even though you may not realize it now, uh, you will find this, uh, especially if you decide to specialize in theoretical physics, you will definitely sooner or later find whatever I've explained quite useful, even though it may not be apparent to you right now. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to conclude in the next two uh, lectures. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.